One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now your wives told your husband this morning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Boy, you're a sad lot. Uh, I didn't count myself, no, because I knew there wasn't no use to it. I didn't want to make, you know, but I did say it several times this morning. Thank you for these gravy and biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that don't count this morning now. I mean, you, know, you got to say it. <laughs> okay. Lord, tell our husbands or wives that we love them now. I, think, I mean, you know, we're getting a little slackish here. I'm hoping that we'll improve. I'm going to start out this morning in Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We got just a few words this morning. Well, I'm telling you, I just am so thankful, Lord. Thankful to be a child of the King this morning. Thankful for the blessings that life pours out upon us. Thankful to be able to be here and hear Kevin teach this morning. My goodness, I've been looking forward to these messages. Hope everybody's been praying for him. We all ought to be lifting up our Sunday school teachers. They've got a tremendous job. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit now Kevin asked us a couple of weeks ago he said tell me who you are this morning I'm asking who's the Holy Spirit we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit who is he? Dictionary simply says, the third person of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, sometimes referred to as the Holy Ghost, are one, the same, the Holy Trinity. We say that, but do we really believe it? The words of the Holy Spirit are recognized as being the words of God, according to the Scripture. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is a person? Sometimes we as Christians think, how can I get more of the Holy Spirit? Anybody ever said that? Oh, almost every day I'm out praying. I say, oh, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. But we should be asking, how can the Holy Spirit get more of me? When we accept Jesus as personal Savior, uh, this person, the Holy Spirit, moves in. The old man out, the new man in. How many times have we heard that preached? Old man out, new man in. The Holy Spirit is a type of guidance counselor. He knows what the Lord wants us to do, and he conveys it to us. But the old man's got to be out or conflict can and will occur. Has anyone here this morning ever said, Jesus, I need some guidance about someone or something? Most every day I say it. I need some help. Mm -hmm. It'll be the Holy Spirit that will give you the answer. His words are the words of Jesus. We recognize God our Father and the love he had for us by sending his son, Jesus, to the cross in our place. We recognize the son, Jesus, and the love he had for us to come and die on the cross for each and every one of us in our place. But do we recognize the Holy Spirit, the love of the Holy Spirit, how he's followed us, Drawed us every minute of every day 
to Jesus so that we'd not die lost and undone. And he's still drawing us today. If you know Jesus, if you've accepted him, he's still drawing you today to a closer walk with him. Amen. It, Matthew 28 and 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So we recognize the Holy Spirit as being deity. The Holy Spirit has the attributes or is the very essence of God. He's engaged in the work of God. And God recognizes and receives the honor for his work. So you see, the Holy Spirit's a very important person in our lives. Very important person in our lives. In our Christian walk. And in our church, the Holy Spirit, he's living within us inside who are not walking after the flesh, but after the Spirit. To be spiritually minded is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now that takes a special person to be controlled Completely by the Holy Spirit. Uh, if I ask for a show of hands, I don't, if you put up your hand, I don't know if I believe it or not. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. This day and time, as things are seem like getting worse and worse, we've got to look to the Holy Spirit to keep us on the right track. Now, I was listening this morning to a preacher, and probably some of you have heard it, and he said, everybody says not to talk about politics in the church, but my goodness, I mean, it's a part of the church. We've all got it on our mind. So let's keep our eyes and mind on Jesus when it comes time to vote, and let's go vote. Be sure to vote. And keep our eyes and mind on Jesus. That's where it's at. Don't cast that vote without praying. Pray and vote. I saw a sign on the road someplace yesterday. Pray and vote. And don't be ashamed of it. Because I love the Lord and I want what he wants. Amen. Not what everybody else wants. The world, I'm telling you, uh, our news is all negative stuff. Tries to drag you uh, plumb down and out of the way. Pray and think about it and vote. It's very important. Amen. So who's the Holy Spirit? He's simply the third person of the Trinity. I couldn't find any better way to put it. But the things he does for us spiritually, I cannot begin to put in words. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one. And let's don't forget that. Each and every one, just important. Amen. Let's love the Lord and serve Him and keep our eyes and mind on Him this morning. Oh, He's a great God. He's a great God. I'm just almost happy enough to take off running down through here this morning and fall on my face. I'm telling you, we need to get excited about the Lord. We need to get excited. I've got another opening, a little more about the Holy Spirit, and we'll get it whenever the time comes. But I'm telling you, look in the Word. Seek His face. Amen. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you every day. Amen. And pray for those that are standing up here and trying to, to bring the Word. Pastor's got a tremendous job. Sunday school teachers, tremendous job. Everyone has a tremendous job here that does anything in the church. Nobody wants to do anything, but we all that are doing anything has a tremendous job, and we only do it for the Lord. We couldn't do it without him. Why would we want to? Let's all love to serve the Lord and just get excited about serving him. Anybody got a word for the Lord this morning? Miss Revi said, give her testimony being thankful. Anybody else this morning? Tracy and Dakota are on a vacation, and they so they went to church about every night from where they uh, saw a tranquility. What's it called? Ventrilist. Huh. And the guy was using a bucket and talking through it, and 
he acted like that with an atheist. And he would give an example of a Christian without the Lord, and he just pulled his hand away from that cup and walked away. And he said, that's what a Christian is without the Lord. And that's what we are without the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're empty. That's right. Amen. Anybody else? A word for the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? I'm glad the Holy Spirit speaks to me one day. Amen. Amen. When you talk about being controlled by the Holy Spirit, the reason that's so hard is if he's speaking to you, he right. will make you do nothing. He will nudge you. He'll say you need to do this. This is what's right. But on the other hand, the enemy. Right. Yeah. Amen. Good work. Amen. You're absolutely right. They use him, use his words, say they know him, but don't bury it up. Anybody else a word for the Lord this morning? Good word this morning. Anybody else this morning? Okay, we'll dismiss our class. Good morning. How is everybody?
We've been talking about the uh, the seven I am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. And today, the stuff that y'all were saying go right along with our lesson. And I hope I, that we can just kind of slow down and go through this and and get something out of it today. Derek, you pray for us. The first one that we talked about was, I am the bread of life. <clears throat> and we said that the bread of life sustains you. It gives your spirit the, what it needs to, to keep going on and not only go on, but live life. And we, talk, we talked about the meaning of life. It was a zoe life, which means an abundant, a happy, eternal, fulfilling life, enjoyable life that you that you enjoy waking up to after that. Uh, then we talked about, he said, I am the light. And we said that it reveals things that darkness hides. So you can live life. And you can, once again, that was Zoe life. And we read the verse that says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness. And the darkness could not comprehend it. And I'm glad this morning that darkness can't comprehend the light. Amen. And especially inside of our heart right. when that light comes in. Today we're going to look at I am the door. And that's another, I said, the, the, when we started this, that the I am the bread, that's kind of a strange statement. But I am the door is also a strange statement. But when we read it, we have to remember, and y'all pray for my voice this morning, that as we read John, but it, it, the whole thing, but we start in John chapter 7 and it goes on through chapter 11, and it, it's all the same, the same story. We, we kind of want to pull a verse out of this and say, well, that was that day and then the next verse of that was that day but this is all the same engagement that Jesus had with these these people and <clears throat> when when you read the bible it's all numbered out you got chapter and verse but when this was first wrote it wasn't it was just a from beginning to end and it told the story and, and even that might would make it easier to understand this particular section, but if it wasn't numbered out and stuff like that, it would tell you the story, and you would realize that it had to start and it had to finish. And all these things that he said so far were in the same conversation that he was having with the same people. So he started out with, I am the bread of life, and now we're up to, I am the door. So somebody tell me what you think of when, if I was to look at you, Alan, and say, I am the door, what would you think of when I said that? The first thing I think of is right, right there, the door. I mean, it makes me think of the door to a house. Turn over to John chapter 10. We're going to start at verse number one. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and calleth, he calleth his sheep, own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, 
for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things which were, were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that have ever, ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go out in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. So, over and over in, in the Word of God, it gives us illustrations that compare God, or in this case Jesus, to the shepherd. And the sheep as his followers. Now, Psalm 23. Think about that just for a minute. It compares the shepherd as the sheep is looking at him. It's from the point of view of the sheep. And that's somewhat strange, but the whole thing's kind of strange. You, you, he, he compares himself to the door. He compares himself to bread, but then he compares himself to a sheep looking at the shepherd. And if I tell a story, that's not the point of view I normally tell it from. I want to tell the story from the viewpoint of the hero of the story. If I was telling that story, I would tell the story from the view of the shepherd. Right? But that's not how the word puts it out. So it, it's all worded in a very strange kind of way. But then you have to look deeper into it to get what out of it that he wants you to see. So we see it's from the viewpoint of the shepherd, I mean of the sheep looking at the shepherd, and we are his followers. Now that gives your imagination the, the picture of looking at the shepherd from the standpoint of the sheep. Good. We understand that, right? Good. So now let's look in order the things that these 10 verses that we look that Jesus talks about in these 10 verses. Number one, he talks about the door. Number two, he talks about the sheepfold. Number three, he talks about the thief and the robber. Number four, he talks about the shepherd. Number five, the sheep. And uh, number six, he talks about a stranger. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the sheepfold. Look at verse number one. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now, somebody tell me what a sheepfold is. I would assume it's where they go in and feed them. I hope they were corralling them up. Dylan, can you pull that picture up? All right. Now that is a sheepfold. And a sheepfold is something that's very important to a shepherd and the sheep. It's an enclosure, just like Cindy said, built from whatever the landscape offers. Normally, rocks, that one is, as a permanent sheepfold. But in a more isolated place, they would build a sheepfold from whatever sticks or brush or anything they could use. And they would take thorns like Jesus was crowned with and coil them up and lay them all over the top of the sheepfold. That way nothing could jump over and get in to the sheep. Now, a sheepfold like that would be used more like close to a, a town or something like that because it's permanent. Now, imagine the shepherd taking the sheep out into the wilderness, and as the sheep are grazing, he, all day long he's building the sheepfold, brush and sticks and piling it up, and creating an enclosure just like that, but out of whatever the land had to offer. That way, when night came, he could take that his flock of sheep and put it into the sheepfold. Beautiful. Now, there's a permanent one, and they would contain lots of flocks. Now, if if I bring my flock and put it into that sheepfold, and then Eric brings his flock and puts it in there, and David brings his flock and puts it in there. When morning comes, how are we going to divide our sheep back out? Am I going to say, well, I put 10 in there yesterday. 
I saw you had 11, but I don't know how many he had. How are we going to divide the sheep back out? All right. Now, y'all think about that just for a minute. We have permanent sheep folds, and we have temporary ones. The temporary ones would be out in the wilderness, created by the shepherd. Now, if you look at that picture, what's the weak point of that sheep fold? There's no door or gate there. The hole. the hole where it's supposed to be. Anything that wanted to, a wolf, a thief, anything could walk right through there. There is nothing to cover that opening. Now, pull up the next picture, Dylan. Now, I can't see it very well, but now you see the sheep in the sheepfold. But look what's at the door. The shepherd all of a sudden puts his sheep into that sheepfold and he lays down across that door to where anything that comes out of that sheepfold he knows about and anything that goes into it he knows about. That's why he calls himself the door. He is in control of what goes in and out of that sheepfold. So now what does the sheepfold offer? Somebody tell me. Protection. Uh, safety. Rest, shelter, and not from the weather. You know, the storms of life are going to come. There's no shelter there. It offers protection from the darkness. Did you know a sheep in the dark becomes so terrified and afraid it will do either stand there and let whatever's after it kill it, or it'll run away till it runs into something and kills itself? Evidently, sheep are pretty stupid animals from what I've studied out. I, I read one thing that said if one sheep walks off of a cliff, all the other sheep will follow it off the cliff. And they'll all kill themselves just because they're so dumb they, they follow each other around that way. But if we're not careful, you know, we're compared to sheep. We'll see somebody stand up and walk out that door mad. And if we're not real careful, I'll get mad and walk out right behind us. Now next he talks about the shepherd. Uh, now the shepherd obviously spends time with the sheep and he cares for them. A good shepherd cares for the sheep. And a good shepherd can tell his sheep even when they are in the midst of many flocks. Now I didn't know this until I studied this out. A good shepherd can call his sheep and only his sheep will come. Also, he can recognize them by the markings their size, their different characteristics they've got on their bodies. But look at the last sentence in verse number three. Let's read the whole verse. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, wow. and leadeth them out. When I studied this out, I learned that most shepherds have all their sheep named. And they can call them sheep by one particular sheep by its own name. Now, Eric's got Fiddy, and we've got Mojo. Now, Fiddy, if she's trained up the way she's supposed to be, I could say, come here, kid, Fiddy, come here, come here, and she would come to me. But Eric should be able to say, Fiddy, get over here, and she would leave me and walk straight over there and meet beside him. Mojo should do, do the same thing for us, which Mojo is now blind and deaf, and he can't really do anything. <laughs> but a well-trained dog recognizes the voice of his master. And when the master calleth, the dog comes. And the sheep's the same way. Amen. The shepherd names the sheep. The shepherd cares for the sheep. The shepherd knows his sheep. And the sheep all know the shepherd. He calleth his own sheep by name. And he leadeth them out. Now, did you know that the shepherd knows you by name? Amen. Psalm ninety-one, fourteen. Because he... Holds fast to me in love. I will protect him. I will deliver him out because he knows my name. That means I have a relationship. Good, now, th think about the shepherd concerning the sheep. The shepherd is there when the sheep is born. The shepherd is there as it's growing up. He, the, the shepherd is there as he has to correct the sheep. The sheep and the shepherd become, they have a relationship. Just like our shepherd. We should have a relationship with that shepherd. But that shepherd looks into the eyes of that sheep and he sees a living creature. 
He understands that this is a living thing that he cares for. And when it comes time for that sacrifice, it hurts the shepherd to see that happen. He's looked into that sheep's eyes. He knows that sheep. So when you are his, he knows you, and you have fellowship with him. You have protection by him. He cares for you. Now look at verse number 7 and verse number 9. Then Jesus saith unto them, again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Now verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out, and find pasture. So Jesus calls himself the door. And obviously, next week we're going to talk about the good shepherd. But we cannot separate verse number one where he calls himself, or verse number two, he says, the shepherd of the sheep. He's talking about himself. We can't separate that from the door at this point. No. Next week we're going to talk about the good shepherd. So he calls himself the door, and obviously he's talking about the door to the sheepfold. Nothing is going in, nothing is coming out without stepping over the door. So in your life, nothing comes in, nothing goes out when you're in his sheepfold that he don't know about. If it comes in there, he's allowed it in. But if you get out of the sheepfold, if you get away from the shepherd and wolves come and whatever comes in your life, the darkness falls on you. Whose fault's that? It's the sheep. So now let me ask you this question. When are the sheep in the sheepfold? At night. At night. Okay, now back to the shepherd in the wilderness. He builds, he uses the whole day, builds that sheepfold, and at night he has to have somewhere to put the sheep or else they can wander off in the darkness. In the dark. Sheep almost totally lose their ability to function when caught out in the dark and away from the flock. So at night and in the darkness, he moves his flock into the safety of the sheepfold. Then he turns himself into the door. When you are his, you are secure. Amen. Nothing is coming in around his flock that he don't know about, and nothing's going out without his consent. You are safe. Don't worry. He's saying, I am the door. I'm not going to put you in a barn and close the door where somebody or something can open that door up and and move right in there to you. I'm going to be there to protect you. I'm turning myself into the door. And the, you're safe from the darkness. And that's what he does. Turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, starting verse number 1. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, and underline that word, of death. Now what did we say that darkness was last week? A complete or partial absence of light. And that's what this is talking about here. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's light missing from the shadow. Listen to what the sheep says. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, this is a perfect example of what Jesus is talking about here. The protection that the door is going to give the sheep. Now, notice how it's worded in, in, back in John. Verse number 7, it says, I am the door. And in verse number 9, it says, I am the door. But it does not say, I am a door. Right. How many openings do you see in that sheepfold? There's only one. Now, 
in the all-inclusive world that we live in, that's not politically correct. That will get you through out of a lot of places. When you say that Jesus is the only way, people don't like that. They want to find their own way. But now somebody tell me what the difference in a sheep and a goat is. The biggest difference is the shepherd can leave the sheep in the sheepfold and they'll lay down there and stay. But they can put a goat in there and a goat will do anything it can to get out of there. Somebody told me one time if water will run through your fence, a goat can get out of it. And there's some goats right down below our house there and they're, they're fenced in a place and they feed them every day. But if when you drive by there, them goats are standing outside the fence eating grass. They just walk right through the fence. The fence is a, a good fence, but somehow the goats get out. The sheep are happy in there. The sheep want to be in the presence of the shepherd, but the goats try to get away. And we're going to recognize the goats and the sheep by the way they act around the shepherd. Now, we are forced in our lives to be all-inclusive. We have to include things that we don't want to include in our life. But God don't work on that timetable or on that, that kind of schedule. God made one way and one way only. And by, there is no other way except by that, through that door that he's talking about here. He provided a way, not many ways. And that's probably his greatest miracle. He didn't provide many ways, but one, and one's all he needed. He did provide one, though. Matthew 7, 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the great the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that enter therein. But there is a way. So what's he saying? He's saying there's only one way, one door, one gate, only one. But God loved you enough to provide one way, and that's the blood of his son, his one and only son. Amen. So he provided a way for your eternity. But what about while we're still here? Did he provide for that? Amen. Look down at verse 10. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have, look at that word, life. Amen. And they might have it more abundantly. Now that's not talking about in heaven. It is talking about in heaven, but not heaven only. It's talking about right here. He came so that we could have Zoe life. And it, you're starting to see a pattern form here, I'm thinking. In every one of these examples, he's saying, I want to give you abundant life. I want to give you a good life. I want to have you have a happy life here on earth. You know, as Christians, a lot of the time, we'll tell somebody that we're a Christian and then we'll look depressed about it. You'll say, yeah, I'm, I go to church on Sunday. And you stand looking down, shaking your head. But it's the best life that you can have. It's, it's the good things that God wants to give you. It's only the best. And that's what he wants to give. Danny said this morning, he said, the enemy will control you. But, and I was thinking about that. The enemy will control you. We fall out into sin and stuff like that, and all of a sudden we're being controlled by the enemy. But the shepherd will lead you. We have to listen to what the shepherd says, take his correction when he corrects us, and use that guidance that he's wanting to give us to move into that Zoe life because that's what he wants to give us. Derek, you pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for your word. You bless me.